please join me in welcoming Joanne Barnard, who is the ambassador for the Victoria Genealogical Society. Joanne. Thank you, Susan. I'm really delighted to be here this afternoon to share my enthusiasm with family history with you. As you might imagine, it's been a quiet couple of years on the ambassador front for the Victoria Genealogical Society. I did one presentation by Zoom. I did one in person earlier this year. Aside from that, it's been really quiet. So I've missed getting out and meeting people and sharing my enthusiasm. Today I plan to just spend a few minutes talking about the Victoria Genealogical Society, but most of the time I want to talk about how you get started doing your own family history, why you might want to do it, and some of the sources you can look at. I plan to take about 50 minutes of your time and leave time for questions at the end, but if there's some burning question that comes up in the meantime, please interrupt me. So we're going to try to put yourself in your family tree, but it'll just be the basics. This is a topic that can take years to get into. How many of you have done some of your family history? Quite a few of you. Yeah, I thought that might be the case in a historical group such as yours. The uh, Victoria Genealogical Society has recently updated our web page. So um, I'm still getting used to moving around in it, but it's pretty user friendly. The site is listed on all the handouts at the side, or at least on the brochure. So please uh, collect one of those and go on to our website and explore. It's pretty easy to get around. Now the first thing you'll see when you open up the page is up in the upper left, a little hyperlink in green saying, join the mailing list. We encourage people to do that because it'll get you regular emails saying what the upcoming meetings are, what the seminars are that are coming up, and so on. And we don't use the list for anything else, so it's perfectly safe to give us your email address and keep up with what's going on in our society. Of course, we hope people will join us, but um, a lot of the activities that we do are open to the public. So please join our mailing list for starters. Now, the mission of our society is right at the bottom of the screen there, to support and promote family history research in Victoria, across Canada, and around the world. And I feel, as ambassador for the society, I'm trying to fulfill at least part of that mission. One of the things you'll see when you go on to our website is, such as in the upper right of the screen there, a listing of the upcoming events. And I wanted to bring this to your attention because we have regular monthly meetings on the second Thursday of every month, which is today's date, right? We have a meeting tonight. Um, we're still doing all our meetings by Zoom, and so it's a Zoom meeting but it is open to the public, so you can register and get the link and join us tonight. Now the topic is bound to be a really good one. It's John Adams speaking about his book that he's recently published on Chinese Victoria, a long and difficult history, which of course is very pertinent for the 100th anniversary of the school strike. Now, if you don't know John Adams, um, if you know about the ghostly walks that occur in downtown Victoria, on, or at least did, I'm not sure if he's back up and running, he tells a great tale and is very entertaining. So I really encourage you, go on to our website where you see that upcoming event for tonight's meeting, click on it and it'll, it'll take you to a registration page that'll uh, get you into tonight's meeting. In addition to our monthly meetings, which we normally held at St. Alden's Church in the uh, Gordon Head area, we have um, seminars most weekends on a Saturday, and those are also open to the public. I think the charge for non-members is $25. Membership in our society is 60, so we try to encourage people to become members. Um, we also have these things called SIGs, or special interest groups. Most of them are geographic in nature, such as the ones you see on the right there for the United States, for England, and for Ireland. But the one that was actually the most popular 
over the last few years is the last one listed there in the lower right, the DNA SIG, because so many people in our society got caught up in getting their DNA tested and wanting to know how to use their results to further their genealogical studies. We have a number of active projects most of the time. Right now it's been pretty quiet because of the pandemic and we've just got the one that's still not completed and that's the digitization indexing of the early charge books from the Victoria Police. That was a fun project. I volunteered to help with that one. Did you too, Susan? Yeah, that's really been a fun one. I would like to see it brought to a conclusion. Did you do any of the, the uh, mugshot books? Oh, yes. Weren't those fun? The pictures were phenomenal. The quality of the photographs was sensational, but that was really a lot of fun to work on. We've um, also had a number of uh, book projects and so on. They've done a, an indexing of the Veterans Cemetery, God's Acre, in the Squamalt, so that's another project that we've completed. So we tend to try to uh, keep active in the community. We also provide research services for a small fee, and you can find that over on the drop-down um, drop box under research. But why would you want to research your family history? Some of you already know some of the reasons why people do this. You might have history stories in your family about some bizarre thing that happened, and you want to find out if it's true. Like, did Uncle George really leave his wife and move off to Manitoba and start another family and what happened there? So you might want to see if you can prove or disprove the stories. Or you might, like me, find that a relative has done a lot of research and left you with the information and you feel a family obligation to carry it on because you're somehow the most likely person to do it, as I was in my family. You might want to find long lost relatives if you had, you know, a, a great grandfather who came over from Scotland to Canada and you heard that two of his brothers maybe went to Australia. You might want to see if you can find what happened to that family once it was in a totally different continent. Getting in touch with history was something I found to be a real benefit for getting into my family history. It was not a topic I was ever particularly interested in. I was more of a math and science kind of person in my youth and didn't really like history at all. But once I found particular ancestors were in certain places and, and times in historical events, it really proved to be a lot more interesting to me. And I found myself doing tremendous amount of research on the American Civil War, for example, which wasn't really something I was ever interested in until I found out my great-grandfather was served in it. If you enjoy puzzles or mysteries, this is really the thing for you because there's no end to the puzzles and mysteries once you get going. When my dad died in 1997, shortly before his passing, he had received a huge package of information from a very distant relative in Norway who sent him just reams of paper of his ancestors going back into the 1600s. And I remember my dad saying, I had no idea I had ancestors back then. And I sort of chuckled because, of course, we all had ancestors back then or we wouldn't be here. However, I did know what he meant. If you don't have names and dates and perhaps stories, locations, something, it's as if they didn't exist. So it sort of brings them to life. But mostly, I think most of us just do it because it's so darn much fun. <laughs> There are some common misconceptions. There are a lot of them. These are just a few. First of all, if you've seen those ads for ancestry on television, you would get the impression that you just hit those green shaky leaves and my goodness, your whole family history is going to appear before your eyes without you doing anything at all. So why would you ever waste your time doing this? It's all there, right? No. no. <laughs> Um, this one came from my husband early on in the late 90s when I got interested in, in uh, doing my family tree. 
and I started getting mounds of paper piling up all over my office at home and he sort of took one look at it and he said, well, Joanne, what are you doing? Why don't you just trace your direct ancestors? And I said, well, that's what I'm doing because at the time I was, I wasn't looking at siblings or the children of siblings or anything at all. I was just going straight up because you have to remember the number, number of ancestors you have doubles with each generation. By the time you get back 10, you've got over 1,000 direct ancestors. Oh, and this is a really common misconception that there's no point looking for your family back in Europe because the name got changed at Ellis Island by somebody who didn't understand the European name and so changed it. That apparently didn't happen. What they did at Ellis Island, for example, was they used the manifests from the ships. So it was the entry that was put on it in Europe that was used for the name that they used at Ellis Island. And I'm sure the same would be true at Pier 21 and other Canadian ports of uh, entry. So when the family name got changed, it was probably by the family itself who tried to make it easier in their North American lives. No interesting stories in my family, none at all. No, mine were just boring people. No, no lords and ladies, no people who got their names in the paper. Um, no, when you start delving into it, everyone's life has a story. And for that matter, do you really want to find a famous or an infamous ancestor in your family tree? This is a picture of Lizzie Borden. And whether or not she did actually do in most of her family with an ax, um, you may not find Lizzie, but you might find, there are all sorts of people you might not want to find in your family tree. So maybe boring would be good. <laughs> So assuming you're not looking for somebody famous or infamous, who are you going to look for? What is your goal in doing this? Are you going to look just for those direct ancestors going back? Or are you going to broaden the field and include the siblings of your direct ancestors? And I have to warn you, if you decide to get your DNA done at some point, this is something you're going to do. You're not only going to look at the siblings of all your direct ancestors, you're going to trace down all their children and descendants you can find to try to figure out how your uh, DNA matched to somebody in Australia. <laughs> in the past, at least, people often just researched the male line going back. It was easier, for one thing, because the surname just stayed the same, and it was easier just to ch uh, chase down the male line. However, that leaves you without great chunks of your family history if you just ignore the women. I don't know how many times I got so frustrated ordering a book back in the day for the family history of a certain family line. And then as soon as you had a daughter, as soon as she got married, she was out of there. Like she didn't belong in that family anymore. Very frustrating. So sometimes feminists decide, well, I'm just going to tra trace the female line. But that, of course, is very difficult because at least in our society, women generally change their names when they get married. And that makes it tough right off the bat to try to figure out who her parents were. So you decide what your goals are and who you're going to look for. Now, assuming you decide you're going to give this a try, where do you start? We always suggest you start with what you have and what you know. So collect what you have at home. Now this little pile of goodies came out of a trunk that my mother left for me when she died a few years ago. I really got a kick out of it because I thought she'd shared most of the stuff with me. But this one was a little metal trunk and on it she had put a piece of masking tape and wrote, I just can't bear to part with any of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Full stop. And I can see why. It was chock full of really good stuff from my perspective, newspaper clippings and certificates and so on. So collect what you have. It might not be something that a mother or father left you, but you've probably got things yourself, such as birth certificates you might have. This is one for my husband's grandfather, John Matthias Barnard, who was born in the Forest of Dean in uh, Gloucestershire, or yeah, Gloucestershire in 1875. And my husband did not know the name of his grandfather's parents until we got this 
birth certificate, which was very helpful because it said his father was James Barnard. He was an overman, which is a, a boss in a mine. His, um, the mother was Emma Matilda Barnard, formerly Smith. How handy is that? Now we know who, what her maiden name was and who gave the information for this certificate. It was the mother, E.M. Barnard. So uh, you can pretty much rely on a document like this. It was created in an official capacity at the time or near the time that the event occurred. The information was given by somebody who knew. Old letters you might find at home, less reliable. Somebody could make up stories. But this one that my aunt had written to my dad at some point, I'm not sure why he kept it. But from my perspective, it was very helpful because it explained to me why I could not find my grandparents on the farm in Saskatchewan in the 1921 census when it first came out before they had it indexed. I was looking by location, and they weren't on the farm. They were in the city. Didn't know that. You might find legal documents. This is an old uh, land deed, but you might find other forms of uh, ownership of property. You might find divorce papers. You might find uh, legal documents from court cases, all sorts of things like that that people might have kept that you might have at home. And people often keep wedding announcements, invitations, birth announcements, funeral cards, that sort of thing, although not totally reliable. Sure gives you some good clues as to when things happened and who was who. Family photos. This is something that a lot of us have. Now, this one is a picture of my husband's great-grandmother, Emma Barnard, formerly Smith. Fortunately, someone, before they gave us a copy of this picture, had put her name on it, and that she died on the 18th of January, 1908. So we know the photograph is sometime before that, not sure when. But at least we have some clue about this photograph. Similarly, my dad gave me um, this lovely photograph of his father's family of origin. So my dad's dad is John Bardall. He's standing in the back row, the taller of the two men standing. And his father, Hans Bardall, seated in front of them. And um, Hans's wife, Annie, sitting over in front of my grandfather. Now, fortunately, my dad identified all of these people for me because my grandfather came up to Canada to homestead in the early 1900s, leaving all the rest of the family in Minnesota. So we didn't really ever know any of this family or their descendants. So without those names, we really wouldn't have a clue who they were. And don't just think about pictures of people. Um, my dad never got to meet his grandfather, Hans. Um, but he uh, did go to see his farm in Minnesota in the 1990s and took this picture of Hans's barn. So, you know, part of the family history that you might collect is pictures of places that are of significance to your family. And other local resources not to overlook include things like our Greater Victoria Public Library for a variety of books, and you can. Um, use their library subscription to Ancestry on there rather than paying hundreds of dollars for your own. Similarly, we have a Victoria Genealogical Society Genealogy Learning and Research Center in the Royal Oak Shopping Plaza, which um, is smaller than our previous one on Alston Street, but it still has a lot of local resources available there. If you want to use that facility, I think they used to say they would charge $5 for three hours use or something, but um, we also have an Ancestry subscription there that you can use. Phone ahead if you're planning to go and check out our center there, because uh, since uh, COVID, it's a bit hit and miss as to when people are there and when they're not there, but it's, uh, it's another resource. The, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of course, has their Family History Center on Mann Avenue. I imagine a lot of you have used that facility. And uh, again, I'm not sure what their hours are these days, but always wise to check ahead. City of Victoria Archives, if you happen to have Victoria people in your, in your background, that's downtown. The BC Provincial Archives um, in the process of transition, but I'm not sure. I think they're still, as far as I know, down by the museum. And uh, BC Vital Statistics also, last time I used them, they were on Fort Street, but I'm not sure again where they are. 
Uh, one of the things you may or may not be aware of for the BC Provincial Archives is they have a wonderful website. They have a genealogy section there. And um, one of the things you can do is if you have somebody who, for example, died in BC, such as my grandfather, John Bardall, he who was the young man standing up, eventually died in 1945 in Vancouver. And I was able to get a copy of his actual death um, uh, record from the archives. If they don't have it on the archives so that you can print it off yourself, you can go to BC Vital Statistics and they will provide you with one free of charge. So you've collected what you have at home, you've looked around the community to see what else you might be able to find. Talk to other people in your family because there might be somebody else who's done some work that will save you the extra footwork. You can pool your information, you can decide who's going to research what if there's somebody. Now this is a picture from uh, back in about 1997 or 8 I think. Uh, this is my Uncle Bob who had started doing our family history on the right. That's me when I was a brunette on the left. We're at a family gathering and he and I are talking about genealogy. We are putting together a family history book for our family reunion in the year 2000 and he and I were just totally engrossed in the conversation about family history. You'll notice everybody else has kind of turned their backs to us. They're off in the distance. That's, that's one thing I should warn you about. Not everybody gets the enthusiasm <laughs> that some of us have for this. But do talk to others in your family. Then you can start to put it on paper. And these days most people end up using computers, but I really recommend you start with some of the sheets such as the ones I've given you as handouts. Just put a few things down, pencil and paper, it'll get you started. So what do you record? Well, all the obvious things, I've listed a lot of them here names and dates and places, everything you can find for births and marriages. I'm just going to click through this because it's all data. Anything you can find that seems relevant. And then the stories. If you find the stories, I've highlighted that because that's the best part. If there are stories associated with anybody, make a record of those before they get lost. And I wish I always obeyed this one myself. I'm really bad about this, and I have gotten better over the years, but make sure you note your sources <laughs> so that you can go back and find that source again, or if somebody else that you're sharing information with needs to know where you got the information about where somebody was born or when they were born, you can at least go back and say, oh, I got it from here. But if you don't make a note, Trust me, it doesn't take 10 years to forget where you, where you found it. You might forget it if it's you know, 10 days ago or even 10 minutes ago if you're not careful and get too carried away. So yeah, sources are important. There are some rules. Again, start with what you know. Seems obvious, but sometimes we like to leap into the unknown. Start with yourself and work from there. Work back and work forward. Don't skip any generations. Again, this is really tempting because, you know, that third great grandfather who was involved in some lawsuit back in the day, he's way more interesting than just talking about me or my parents. But don't leap back there. Work your way back. Connect everybody as you go. And this is a personal pet peeve of mine. Record dates in a way that people will not misunderstand. How often do you see things such as 10-12-09? You don't know which of those is the month, which is the year. You don't even know what century you're in. So put it down so that people understand exactly what you're talking about. And again, record your sources. Now you're going to start to create your family tree at some point if you get into this. And there are the two main um, charts that we use are the pedigree chart, what's usually called a family tree, where it lists those direct ancestors. Starts with a person, lists parents, grandparents, and so on. And this is an example of one. It can go horizontally, it can go vertically, it can go down, it can go up, but whichever way it goes, it's going to start with one person, then go to two, then go to four, and so on. 
The other common chart is what's known as a family group sheet. That puts a person into his or her family, the mother and the father, such as here, the husband and wife, and then the children, listed in the order of their birth. And there's a certain amount of room on these sheets to put in all that information. I encourage you to, to start by filling in those sheets, just with pencil and paper, no matter what you're going to do. If you're going to take it somewhere to have somebody else help you, if you're going to sit down and try to do research on your own computer, it's so helpful just to have all that information in one place to get you going so you know who exactly you're looking for and what years and so on. Focus on one person or at least on one family group at a time, starting with yourself and, and working back and forward. Collect all the records you have for the group, prepare a family group sheet, and only then get ready to start researching on the internet. I've lopped off um, all the children on this family group sheet, but just to give you an example of filling one in with pencil and paper, this is my mom and my dad. Since all of um, their four children are still alive, I don't put that information out in the public. That's one of the rules of, of genealogy. You keep um, personal information of living people personal. You don't go sharing that all over the internet for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, the one thing that these paper charts do not do is give you a place for putting your sources. If you get a database on your computer, it will have a place for putting your sources. But for now, if you're doing paper, you can make a notation on the side where you've put the information and then flip the paper over and write down what those sources were so you don't lose them. In this case, it was a birth certificate and a marriage certificate that I used for those bits of information. And then from that, you can start your pedigree chart. You can start filling in you know, parents' names and grandparents' names and so on. Then, the first place I would recommend that you go if you're going to start researching on the internet, go back to our Victoria Genealogical Society website and under the research tab, where I've got it dropping down there, I mentioned the research services that people can pay for, which is the top item, but you'll see if you go down that list that there are links to BC genealogy, Canadian genealogy, and general genealogy. So if you click on those, you'll see things like this, where there are hyperlinks to all sorts of specific websites that'll get you involved in Victoria, Vancouver Island, and the Gulf Islands, and spreading out from there. Then under the general genealogy links, for example, there will be beginner genealogy guides. So if you start to feel confused, obviously this 50-minute talk that I'm giving may not do more than just confuse you. So if you really want to get into some of this and understand it, there are all sorts of beginner guides and general resources that you can click on here and have a better look at. Other sources in addition to our web page, which is the first one I've got listed there, the FamilySearch.org website is one that I am very, very highly recommending. This is the one associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And no, I'm not a member of that church. They do not try to convert you. It's just a wonderful, wonderful resource, free of charge. Uh, for everybody to use to research their family. And I'll get into a couple of the things that you'll find on their website a bit later, but I highly recommend that one, and it is on the list on uh, one of the handouts I've got of suggested websites. Then don't forget that there are things like archives, libraries, vital statistics, societies, organizations, and local histories. If you've got ancestors in any particular place, look and see what kinds of resources are in that area that might have a website that you can go and research on. And finally, don't forget that you can just do a Google search for your ancestors. Um, I Googled the word genealogy a couple of days ago when I prepared this, and um, I got over 201 million, I got 201 million results just for the word genealogy. 
So, so you're going to find a lot of genealogy records in there. However, you won't just Google genealogy. What you'll do is Google maybe genealogy and then some names from your family or a place or dates or something to narrow it down. You don't want to be looking at 201 million results, trust me. Now, as with most things on the internet, you have to take what you find with a grain of salt because you know things like this can appear. <laughs> it's not all gospel. <laughs> You find yourself getting confused and not knowing where to start, particularly if you have ancestors from a place where you don't speak the language and you're not familiar with it. You might want to use a research wiki. Now this is from the FamilySearch.org website, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints website. And under the search tab where you see the blue arrow coming down, the very last thing under search, I mean, you can search for records, images, et cetera, et cetera, but the very last thing is the research wiki. And it's an absolute wealth of information you can get from there. When you click on it, what, this is what opens up. It's a map of the world. Okay, so say I wanted to look for my dad's Norwegian ancestors, Hans Bardal and some of his family. Say I wanted to look for that. I would click on Europe and then a map of Europe would appear. Then I would click on Norway and a map of Norway would appear. It breaks it right down into the counties. You can hone right in. It will give you links to resources that are available for this specific location. It'll give you um, research aids. If you don't know the language, it'll give you glossaries of the terms used in genealogy in that particular language. It'll give you all sorts of things to get started. I can't recommend it highly enough. So when I did this and got down to the county, Nordland County in Norway, which is where my great-grandfather Hans was born, it lists all sorts of things down under contents at the lower left there. Family history resources, government offices, cities, parishes, church records. Now in Norway, church records are the official records. They were the, the state Lutheran church there was mandated by the government to keep the official records. So that's where you go to find the, the birth, marriage, and death records. And if you don't understand the language, because of course it's in Norwegian, you can go to the little glossary, find out what the common terms are, and at least figure out what the headings are. Doesn't mean you can read all the details in every record, but it'll certainly get you the, the basic data. And when I looked for Hans's birth record, I indeed found it in the birth records and baptism records for the year 1841. His is the one with the little blue arrow beside it. It says when he was born, it gives his parents' names. So that was very helpful. That is his official birth and baptism record combined. Another thing you're going to find when you start researching, whether on the FamilySearch.org site or Ancestry site or others, is some census records. Usually by doing a search, what you find is the transcribed record, which is what shows up on the left. This is where someone has taken the time to type in the information that they have seen on the actual handwritten census form. So there's lots of room for error there because people's handwriting is sometimes easier than others, people's transcribing ability is sometimes easier than others. And um, the other thing is that often all the headings that were transcribed are not all the ones that you would find on the original document. So it's always worth finding that original census record. If it's available, look at that because it'll contain more information and it'll give you the opportunity to assess whether they got the name right, etc. Don't expect these to be 100% accurate. People lied about their ages all the time when here. I have one set of family members where the women, oh, they were, they were notorious. It wasn't just the women either, but mostly the women, especially when they married younger men, they were shaven almost a decade off their, off their age and they got away with it. <laughs> ah, dear. <clears throat> Another thing that is useful is city directories. Now, you're not going to find a lot of information in there, but you can find where people were living at a point in time. Depending how the directories are organized, you might find if somebody 
uh, who, who was living next door, who the neighbors were, that can be interesting. Sometimes telling if you know somebody from one family might end up marrying somebody from another family. Um, sometimes there are advertisements. If your ancestor was in business, you might find a little business card notice in there. Now this, um, when I pulled off the Vancouver Public Library site, they have done a wonderful job of making all the city directories for the province of British Columbia available online. So you don't even have to go to our public library and route through the paper copies of the ones for Victoria. You can go on here and find the ones for Victoria. Another thing that can provide you with some good hints are the Billion Graves or Find a Grave websites. This is the entry for my dad. Um, they're not guaranteed to be 100% accurate either. It depends on who put in the information. Um, I'm pretty sure the information is all correct here. I didn't input it originally. It was another volunteer for, this, for the uh, Find a Grave site who had put this in and taken the picture of his headstone. Um, but what it does enable you to do is family members can then be linked in. So from this site, if you look down in the lower right corner there where it says family members, my dad's parents both have theirs listed and those I did put in, they're both buried in Vancouver. And um, my mother's is also listed over there and they're hyperlinked so you can click on those and you can sort of start together, put together a whole family just by using the Find a Grave site. Newspapers are another wonderful source. They really flesh out the stories. Quite often you might hear, okay, well, so-and-so got divorced, but sometimes you get all the juicy details in the newspaper articles. <laughs> Not guaranteed to be 100% accurate, but good for, for giving you the stories. Now this one that I've uh, put in here, Mrs. Edwards of Castle Rock dies. This is my uh, great, is she? She's my great-great-grandmother, Mrs. Charles F. Edwards. She was actually Mary Jane Westcott Edwards. It's always tricky when all they did was give women's names by saying they were Mrs. Husband's name. <laughs> but anyway, she, she uh, had died quite young. I think she was 50, if that. And uh, following having all her teeth extracted, and I often wondered about that. It seemed like a strange story. But when I researched that, apparently it was a thing back in the 1920s. If you were really sick and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with you, pull out all your teeth mm -hmm. and hope that that fixed you. It didn't fix her. <laughs> so yeah, obituaries, um, news items, personal interest stories, all sorts of things you can get from newspapers. Then you're going to have to organize all this information that you're collecting. Whether you've got paper, you want to put it in a binder or filing cabinet, and all your data on the computer, you've still got to organize it right or it's just a big mishmash of stuff. Now most people end up using some sort of uh, software on computer to keep track of their family history. And I really recommend that you do that on your own computer for sure. Now you can also put it on Ancestry or put it elsewhere but don't just rely on that because if those sites out there go down for any reason, cease to exist or suddenly start charging you $1,000 just to access your tree, you don't want to have to rely on it. So get something on your own computer so you're in control of it. There are a lot of software choices out there. There's certainly a handful that are all excellent. I use Roots Magic, but there's also Legacy, which is wonderful, and I think Family Tree Maker, a lot of people rely on, there's a lot of really good ones. They usually offer you a free version that you can download right from their website. And then if you decide you need more bells and whistles, you can pay a few bucks to, to get the uh, premium version. It's not as expensive as it used to be. I remember the first time I bought Family Tree Maker software back in the day, it came on discs and I, I'm sure it was well over $100 just for that. It's, you know, these days it's not that expensive. So now the shared trees, one, there are a couple of them out there certainly. The wiki tree is one and the other one is the one on the familysearch.org website. Um, if you go into the site, you'll see that one of the headings there with the drop-down menu is family tree. 
and their idea is to connect all humankind, really, I think, into one tree. They want everybody to connect, and we all do connect at some point. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do to use their site is just to register. All they need is your name and an email address. They will not ask you for credit card information. They will not hound you for other personal information of any sort, just a name and an email address. And the reason that they want you to do that is so that they know who's in there making changes to things. Because this is one big family tree, you, you might get back such as, this is mine, I'm Joanne on the left, and then my parents, my grandparents. By the time I got over to my great-grandparents, a message popped up when I was inputting this into the family tree on there, and it said, we think we already have this couple on here. Check and see, are these the people? And then if you, say, you look and you say, yeah, that's the, right, that's the right family, you say yes, well then you're hooked into that family and then you know, if there are ancestors for them going way back, you're hooked right into that tree very easily. But it means it's not your tree. Other people can go in there and change that, and they do. Which is a good thing and a bad thing, right? <laughs> it's good because hopefully it makes for more accuracy overall and makes for a bigger tree, but it's bad if bad information starts getting input and, and you can't seem to get it out of there. So there are ways to collaborate on here, which is the big advantage because you, you can share information with other people. There's a couple of ways. First of all, where the red drop-down arrow is, there is a section for collaborating right on the site. So this is the person's information for my great, great grandmother, Barbara Hoover. And um, you'll see that there isn't any collaboration there. It's zero. Nobody's been collaborating that way. So the other way that people collaborate basically is if somebody goes in and makes a change to the information on Barbara Hoover, the changes are listed over there on the right-hand side under latest changes. It'll tell you what was changed and it'll say by who. And there's a link there on the by who so that you can send that person a message and find out more. Now that's really handy, not just for the information, but because, aha, this person's also interested in the same people, probably related, quite possibly, and you might be able to share more information. Now by doing that, in the one case for Barbara Hoover, I was able to collaborate with another uh, descendant of hers and get a picture of her, which I had just wanted so badly for so long and finally got it from him. He sent me a whole package of stuff from, uh, I think he lives in Utah. And uh, one of the things, was, well, a couple of the things included pictures of my grandmother when she was a little girl with some of her brothers, and I'd never seen those pictures. So I got some wonderful resources by sharing information on that family tree. Ancestry is a bit different. You can have family trees on there. It's on their website. So again, they're in ultimate control, but it is your tree. Nobody else is going to go in and mess with your tree unless you give them permission to. So this is my tree on ancestry. You can have it private so that nobody else can even see it, or you can have it public so that other people can see it and then get in touch with you if they want to collaborate on things. And this is an example of what my software looks like in Roots Magic with my family tree showing my grandfather John Bardall and his wife and going back to Hans and Anna and so on. Now in addition to organizing the actual data on a computer, for example, paper is going to pile up probably unless you're really good at getting rid of the paper. Um, so you'll need binders or filing cabinets or something. Some people use shoe boxes, whatever works for you, just whatever system works. And I always also say, your own personal history is also part of family history. So good idea to write it, because if you don't write it, do you really trust those kids and grandkids to write it for you? <laughs> I like to be in control of my own family history. Not to say that they can't come along later and change it, but you know, yeah, it's a good idea to do it. People procrastinate. We all think we're immortal. No, we don't think we're immortal. We feel that we're immortal. 
we know that we're going to die, but somehow deep down we don't really think it's going to happen, at least not anytime soon, right? So we procrastinate because we've got all the time in the world. And we also procrastinate because it's a huge job if you think about writing your whole story. So good idea if you decide to do this and it just sounds overwhelming is to take off little bites. I know when I learned to ski, going down the whole mountain was too much, but if I looked at little waypoints along the way that I could ski to, it made it so much more manageable. So 52 questions in 52 weeks, if you look that up on, on the internet, I think I've put that in my uh, handout too, uh, gives you some ideas for, for little snippets of things you could write about to s start getting your family history done without having the overwhelming sense that it's too much. Fortunately for me, my son asked my dad to write his family his, or his own personal history back in the 1990s. I get a kick out of this because my dad, at, at 1942, he was 16, he decided he wanted a convertible. And so he was going to work on farms and make his fortune so that he could afford a convertible. So he, he wrote the story about you know, the hardships of working on the farm. And in the end, he said, after harvest was completed and wages paid to me, I was able to buy a second-hand bicycle. Far cry from the Dodge convertible I'd had my eye on the previous months. Now, I get a kick out of this because I've always loved this picture of my, my dad and his father. My dad's the very dapper young man with his foot up on the front, uh, what do you call it, fender? No, not fender. Bumper, yeah, whatever, of the car, looking like he's stepping, you know, out of gentleman's quarterly or something, very dashing. This is at about the same time that he's working on the farm for five dollars a month, a follow up, five dollars a day, yeah, okay, and being able to ride his bicycle. So it looks like I think he's going to be allowed to drive his dad's car that day. Anyway, got a kick out of that. So you can uh, do things like matching photos and newspaper clippings and stories to try to put your story together. This is my parents' wedding picture from 1947 along with the newspaper wedding announcement. So you can just start combining things to try to put the story together. Then once you've done a story, whether it's your own personal history, just a little snippet of a story about somebody, and you want to sh put it somewhere so it's not lost, you can share it out there. Again, this is the familysearch.org website. And one of their other columns, you'll see where the little blue arrow comes down to memories. You'll see beside that, to the left, you'll see the family tree, where you can go in and input your family, like I had done. Um, you can see the search drop down where you can search for all sorts of records. And there's also that uh, search wiki. So this website is just full of stuff, but memories. That allows you to go in and actually post your stories, post your pictures, so that other people can look at them. And um, for example, this is for Barbara Hoover. She's the one who um, I was so happy to get the picture of. And you'll see under memories where the blue drop down comes down that it says there are two memories. And the first one, which is sliding off the page, is that photo of her that was shared with me. And then the second one at the bottom, it's the ancestry of Winfield Scott Lemon. And that is the gentleman who sent me the pictures. And he has done a whole family story about himself and his parents and, and how he connects into the, the family, which is available for anyone to see on there once he's dead. And he has now, he is deceased, so it's available. So you can post your own family story on your own little space on the family tree. There will be a place to put these memories. You can post it in there, but nobody else is going to see it until you're dead. The other thing that you can put in there, and I did this for my, my uh, great aunt, she had um, a story about running a, a service station in Moses Lake and, and her nephew had um, told a story that his kids had recorded. So you can take audio recordings of stories and input them in there too. So it's not just limited to visual things. So all sorts of opportunities there. So that really wraps up what I wanted to share with you today. I really encourage you to sign up for our mailing list way back at the beginning of our website um, to check 
as to what's coming up in the way of workshops, seminars, meetings. We do have a Twitter account and a Facebook group that we encourage people to join. And we also encourage you to join the Victoria Genealogical Society itself. Join us and join the fun. So getting into your family tree can lead you into all sorts of surprising places. I'd like to say thank you to Joanne. You're welcome. Oh, you covered everything. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>